Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black Matt Norlander is here with me, and I'm sure you heard the Sweet 16 of this 2024 NCAA tournament is now set. Lots of chalk. We're going to get to that, but I want to start the day with the ACC because the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference, is accounting for 25% of the Sweet 16. North Carolina made it, Duke made it, Clemson made it, NC State made it. Congratulations. And this comes after various ACC coaches and lots and lots of fans, most of whom appear to have X slash Twitter accounts. Uh, they've been screaming for weeks, if not months, that their conference deserved at least as many bids as the Mountain West Conference got and that their conference was vastly underrated by the masses and all the computers dead leg. Given where we're at in the bracket right now, do those ACC coaches and fans, do they have a point or no, not really? They have a point. They have a right to crow. I'm not going to, I'm not going to push back on, uh, on ACC folks, by the way, ACC and big East. Now the big East only got three teams in They're all in the field and to the sweet 16, but those teams lived up to their seed expectation. UConn, the one Marquette, the two Creighton, the three, you're supposed to make it into the second weekend when you are a one, two and three seed with the ACC. You got, it's, it's a little bit different here. Um, the conference on the whole non Virginia division aside, has uh has been impressive in what it's been able been able to do uh nc state going from 11 line all the way to the sweet 16 and it's our it's our darling story it's not a cinderella story by the way cinderella's come from mid-major conferences so if you're a power conference team that makes a deep run as a double digit seed i'll give you a sleeper i'll give you a dark horse i'll give you a team that's easy to root for all the same and nc state's a lot of fun but it's really the inclusion of NC State as the only double-digit seed GP into the regional semis that really that sells this. Clemson as the six also over you know overperforming seed expectation was able to beat Baylor and beat Baylor convincingly 72-64 on Sunday. They have a case. Uh, the ACC did not rate as a top three league in the country this season at Ken Palm. Did not even rate as a top four league in the country this season at Ken Palm. It was it was a firm fifth. And now, as you look uh, as you look ahead to the Sweet 16 matchups, and we'll get into more of the matchups as we go on on this uh, Made for TV Pod episode for you. Um, you're going to see that Clemson against Arizona. Clemson is the underdog. You're going to see that uh, NC State against Marquette. NC State <laughs> is the underdog. You're going to see Houston against Duke. Duke is the underdog and uh, North Carolina against Alabama, UNC, obviously a, a very, very good team. Those are two highly rated teams uh, that have been in the predictives all season long. North Carolina rates is the better team. And that is uh, that is the favorite there. But um, the conference continues to perform so well in the tournament GP that uh, I welcome the crowing and the I told you so is from uh, from ACC folks, because when it matters, they have performed uh, better than any other conference in the tournament so far this this so far GP. I mean the the Big East has yet to lose, but there's just three teams. The ACC had a tougher it had a tougher road overall with all that, um, and it has the most teams. Four teams in Big East has three in the Sweet 16. No other league has more than two. Five bids for the ACC, and what's interesting is that on Selection Sunday, I know among ACC coaches and ACC fans, the conversation was we deserve more. Why not Pitt? But among bracketologists and other people who follow the sport closely and maybe uh, don't pay, take a paycheck or and or, uh, you know, have a degree from a ACC school. The conversation among those people was mostly how did Virginia get in? In other words, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like if you go back to Selection Sunday on that day, most people were wondering how did Virginia get in to give the ACC five, not as much mm -hmm. as how did Pitt get left out because the ACC should have had six. Is that a, is that a correct uh, yeah, assessment yeah, yeah. of where we were? That, yes. Yes. Now Pitt was actually even closer to the cut line than, than people might've uh, expected there, but it was the, the conversation was more around Virginia and Virginia didn't have a good showing. Obviously Virginia didn't deserve to be in the field at all, but um, there was a lot of that there. Uh, but you can't deny that uh, the ACC's performance on balance in this tournament continues to be reliable. And so, yes, I acknowledge, I acknowledge, I, I playfully, well, GP, I playfully welcome all of this. I actually think it's, it's kind of funny, like the fact that they continue to do this. And so, yeah, stand on, uh, stand on your accomplishments as a league, whether you went to an ACC institution or you happen to live near an ACC institution, uh, anything regardless, um, good on you. I saw Jim Phillips, the ACC commissioner at Barclays 
on Sunday. He was there to see Duke. And then uh, he disappeared soon thereafter. And as I tweeted out, uh, I was looking for him. I couldn't find him. But for all I know, uh, he had taken to the roof of Barclays Center to howl at the moon uh, in celebration over what the ACC had accomplished there. Uh, big, big gains there to have 25% of the teams remaining in this bracket. Yeah, I don't know that they're right, but I don't mind them being loud because I, I would too. I mean, geez, just go back to uh, last week, Colorado State blew out Virginia. A Mountain West school blew out the team that finished third in the ACC. I couldn't wait to tweet about that. Now, I haven't tweeted about the Mountain West since then. I stopped. I'm done. I, no, I stopped, stopped tweeting about yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I've yeah. moved on. I've moved on. But if I'm going to, if I can't wait to jump on Twitter, and and point out that Colorado State just just destroyed Virginia, then I'm not going to uh, blame any ACC fan for jumping on Twitter or anywhere else and pointing out that you are accounting as a league for 25 percent of, of the Sweet 16. Uh, but all that acknowledge and there's no way to even go down this path without sounding like a hater. But. I just fundamentally at my core don't believe that things that happen on Selection Sunday should have any impact on what should have happened on Selection Sunday. For instance, you might remember this in last year's NCAA tournament, Purdue was a one seed, lost to Fairleigh Dickinson in the round of 64. And after that happened, it never for a second made me think that Purdue should have been something less than a one seed or that Fairleigh Dickinson should have been, uh, you know, something more than a 16 seed or that more teams from Fairleigh Dickinson's league should have been in the NCAA tournament tournament because look what Fairleigh Dickinson just did like we don't do this in other places typically so I don't know why we're always eager to do it in places like this I guess I'd say if you want to make an argument that the only thing that really kept Pitt out of the field is a terrible non-league strength of schedule and if the committee would have focused more on what Pitt did in its league and less of uh, 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 on how Pitt scheduled in its non-league, then Pitt would have ended up on the right side of the bubble. And or if the bubble doesn't shrink as much as it would have shrunk, as much as it ultimately did, Pitt would have been in the mm -hmm. field and we wouldn't even be having this conversation because Pitt was really the only other ACC school that had a legitimate chance by the time we got to Selection Sunday. If you want to say any of that stuff, I'm fine with it. But I just, I don't, I, and I, I promise you every league in the country that gets lots of teams into the tournament is going to be on, uh, you know, a, a, a once is going to be on both sides of this. At some point, you will be a league that puts a bunch of teams in the tournament and then they don't perform and people say you don't deserve it. And there will be, you'll be a league that gets a few teams in the tournament and they do perform and folks will say you deserved more. I just think I'm almost always going to say whatever happens after selection Sunday is just stuff that happens after selection Sunday. And I'm not going to get caught up in it too much more than that. Among the high major leagues, here are the records in the tournament as of Monday. Big East is six and zero. Oh, ACC is eight and one. Big Twelve is seven and six. Pac Twelve is six and three. The Big Ten is six and four, and the SEC is five and six. The Mountain West uh, claims three or four victories to its name. Two of them, San Diego State, um, six bid league for the Mountain West. Unfortunately, just like last year, after a good season for the Mountain West, only the Aztecs have moved on to the second weekend. Utah State did get one win. Uh, but then it got blitzed out by Purdue big time on Sunday. Colorado State get, did get one win, and then it got blitzed out itself um, in the in the first round there. Uh, I think some of this ACC talk is also coming from the fact that the coaches and people around them were just trying to say, "Hey, listen, the teams in our league collectively are better than we're giving than we're being given credit for by some." And I get that. And this, I think, some of this is also a read on not just like should Pitt have been in or whatever. Yeah, and I don't think people really had issues with how ACC teams were seeded, which is which is I think fair. Um, but it's more all right, rubber meets road, NCAA tournaments here, winner go home, and the ACC has been has stepped up to its historical reputation as as arguably the the proudest conference in men's college basketball history. You know, Big East is right there with it, obviously, but the ACC is you know three decades or more older than than the Big East there, and so for the for the conference again to uh to get this done and to have from by win percentage um tie the big east in 93 uh uh brian ives had this out of north carolina he had this stat credit to him uh best win percentage through the first two rounds of the tournament by by a conference uh since the big east in 93 so that was really really impressive for the league and it's in a good spot overall i think because 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 you've got Duke, I was there in person in Barclays, and and Duke has found the edge. Now I understand they beat two double digit seeds, but you're in the tournament, and it, it was just no doubt about it in either one. That's a really really good sign. Clemson, kind of helping the league out, perish where there was a lot of like the Big Twelve, 
computer trickers galore. And what did Clemson do? It went out and knocked off a Big 12 team, um, getting it after destroying a hot New Mexico team, just destroying them the way that it's been able to do this. North Carolina got down early to Michigan State and then just pushed Tom Izzo and his team out of the building, made it a, uh, a no doubt about it kind of situation. And then NC State, it did get a scare from Oakland, but it, it got through. It beat six, it beat a Big 12 team, and then it was able to take out the uh, the biggest Cinderella of the tournament there. So it's how the ACC teams have actually gone about getting into the second weekend, the way they won their games, how they won their games. Credit to that league, credit to those coaches, credit to those players. There's a lot of interesting stories uh, that's that still await with that conference as we get ready to curl toward Thursday night. I'm glad you mentioned Oakland because NC State eliminating them played a role in mid-majors being absent completely from this Sweet 16. We lost Oakland. We lost Yale. We lost Grand Canyon. We lost Duquesne. We did have upsets early in the NCAA tournament. Shouts to Jack Golke. But now we've gotten very, very chalky with this Sweet 16. We're going to touch on that next. Be back in a couple of minutes. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. I am Gary Parrish, Matt Norlander joining me. Oakland, Yale, Grand Canyon, Duquesne. They gave us some thrills in the opening week of the NCAA tournament, but they're all gone now. The Sweet 16 has gotten very chalky. All four number one seeds remain alive. All four number two seeds remain alive. Two of the three seeds, two of the four seeds, two of the five seeds, plus a six in Clemson and an 11 in NC State. That means all the mid-majors are gone, unless you want to call San Diego State a mid-major, and I'm not doing that. They've been in four straight NCAA tournaments. They played the championship game last season. I'm not calling the Aztecs a mid-major. That seems disrespectful. The only double-digit seed left is... Uh, an ACC program that's won a national championship in my lifetime. Degna, do you like this chalky Sweet 16, or do you miss, you know, not having a what would be a traditional and real Cinderella story? I wanted a Cinderella in the Sweet 16. I think the tournament is always bettered by having at least one of those teams in. Um, and yet again, we have a double-digit seed into the second weekend. That has happened every year except two uh, in the history of the tournament, 07 and 93, 95, something like that. Um, so at least we get that uh, that flavor again. And NC State is very, very easy to root for. It has Cinderella-type qualities, but again, um, it is not a Cinderella. NC State, you, you cannot be called a Cinderella. I'm sorry. That is not, will not be allowed here, not in this court, uh, not whatsoever. But in absence of that, and it would have been great to have Oakland there. I mean, that would have been – Oakland would have been the biggest deal going into the second weekend if it was in the field and it had it that's a real real quick look back they botched the final possession and then it wound yeah. up being uh off blend of regulation gp they really had a chance like let's just real quick like they they had the thing that's and listen i'm not rooting for one team over another i'm rooting for the best stories and oakland to the sweet 16 would have been a great story but i was just bummed that they didn't even get the shot off gp in regulation against nc state I understand using Jack Golke as a decoy there to get a different shot. I just, I'm playing for the movie. You know, at that point, I'm just playing for the movie. And I'm just going to run him off a thousand screens. And he can shoot it from 35 feet. I don't care. But that ball's coming out of his hands in that final possession. I think you're right, Oakland. Because what, what television ratings in the past have shown us is that Cinderella's are good for the round of 64, maybe the round of 32. By the time you get to the Elite Eight or the Final Four, you don't really want them. A, because they're not big brands that naturally pull eyeballs, and B, because eventually when you are overachieving and surprising one team after another, you typically get to a point and it just ends with a blowout. Think of St. Peter's a few years ago. Like, they win. Wow. They win another one. Woohoo! Eventually they get just bombed. And that's how that ends. And that's not great for TV, having one blowout after another. So what history tells us is that having the big brands, even an NC State team that's a double-digit seed, the brand of NC State, the brand of the ACC, what history tells us is that is actually better in terms of trying to get the biggest audience we could possibly get. 
But I think I'm with you. I think Oakland and Jack Golke had reached a, a different level, whereas if we would have had them in the Sweet 16 instead of NC State, it would have still been the type of story that that people cared about and people were attracted to. Yeah, but we don't get it. And uh, but congrats to that. That's still and we mentioned this on our uh, one of our reaction shows um, a, lot, a few days ago. I'm losing all concept of time and day, by the way. Uh, Oakland is forever. Jack Golke, his he's in the all time March Madness highlight reel like that. We're not forgetting about that for for decades now because of all the ones and twos moving on. And credit to Colorado for really making an interesting against Marquette uh, and Shaka Smart getting to the second weekend for just the second time in his career. This is only the fifth tournament, folks. We we have had every single one and two bump on to the 16. 2024 joins 2019, 2009, 95, and 89. Shouts to Taylor Swift as the only years where no ones and twos were felled early. And what do we get? What's the trade-off here? is a lot of compelling matchups. I would argue that the least compelling matchup is probably Clemson, Arizona. But even that, um, you have an Arizona team that is capable uh, and I think talented enough to win a national championship going against a Clemson team that has, uh, you know, Brad Brownell has avoided, uh, he's not avoided the hot seat. He's avoided getting fired like 10 years running and now he's back in the Sweet 16. (laughs) Job security is more than safe. Um, and even that's good, but Creighton, Tennessee on the two, three in the Midwest, Purdue, Gonzaga for the third time in what GP 13 months or so. Um, and both those teams just steamrolled into the second weekend. Just no doubt about it with both of them, Carolina against Alabama, that, that could be the most entertaining game we see. And if it's not, well, what about where I'll be in Boston? I get UConn against San Diego state. I get a rematch of the national championship game. I get a San Diego state team that somehow has has made a case here to be just as good as the team that it was last season and has a player in Jaden Ladee who's been outstanding and uh and and Dan Hurley you know using anything that's put against him as a slight he's got to face the team he beat in the national championship he had to go against FAU or Northwestern in the second round he's in the toughest region there is plenty of intrigue there and then uh, Iowa Illinois State I don't know or Illinois versus Iowa State Iowa Illinois State we'd actually have to call some people Illinois versus Iowa State I don't know if you saw this but when Ken Palm refreshed Iowa State not Houston is now the number one team in off in defensive efficiency and Illinois and not UConn is the number one team in offensive efficiency. So we have the best offense and the best defense in the sport squaring off in the sweet 16 in Boston on Thursday night. And then real quick on the other side, Duke is playing better than it has. It's coming off his best game of the season. Houston barely squeaked through against a and M. Oh my goodness. That game perished that game. Get, get out of here with how that game even got to overtime. That was crazy. So you have Houston Duke, and then NC State, Marquette, those teams once upon a time, by the way, played a game for the national championship in the 1970s. So uh, what we have as a trade-off in absence of Cinderella is basically every single Sweet 16 game brings a compelling element, at least one, if not two, three, or four. Not to get off track, but the interview you did post-game with Dan Hurley was hilarious. Like, he genuinely does believe that the committee n- not only made it hard for him, but, like, intentionally made it hard for him. He really, he genuinely thinks that's true, doesn't he? Oh, not just that. There, there is, there is that. Um, there is. I mean, he was even saying, you know, he was talking with other media and stuff. It's just, it's not. It's the early game. It's not on. It's not on big CBS. UConn isn't getting all the shine. It's the reigning national champion. They, uh, without a doubt, it is. It is part of it. And and people have picked up on his comments, and it seems to have become a, a thing here. But I, I knew, and we can get back on track. But I knew, like, I got him for HQ after they won. And the tip times had come out on my way to his press conference. And so I was basically with him. So I knew that I was almost positive. He did not know when he was playing and under what circumstances. Um, And so then I I informed him. So you are getting his calculation in real time of how I'm going to react this. I'm on camera. I'm on the record, but I'm still not happy with this. And so that was even Hurley maybe trying to filter himself even more than he wanted to in real time. I do believe, because it's just true, that UConn's region was seated more in a more difficult way than it should have been. I agree with him. I just don't think it was intentional. I just think sometimes the committee doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, I don't think they're out to make things really like we cannot let like the way Dan tells the story. It's almost like, all right, guys, get in here. Shut the door. We cannot let Dan Hurley, of all people, be the first coach to win back to back titles since Billy Donovan. So how are we going to prevent this? Like, that's almost the way he tells the story. And I just don't I don't think that's right. 
but I do find it hilarious. And I actually yeah. also think it's helpful um, in his a attempt to become everything that he's become like that, that mindset plays a role in it. In other words, I, I'm, I'm sure you saw it because it went viral as well. In the round of 64 game, UConn's up a billion at halftime. And he's talking to Tracy Wolfson and Tracy's like, uh, Daniel, I see you shaking your head. What's wrong? And he's like, I just don't like that. I just don't like the last couple of minutes there. You know, that is not championship level basketball. And in this tournament, he just goes on this thing. They're up by like a billion points. But the fact that he holds his players accountable for every little thing and stresses how important every possession is, not just talks about it, but actually like, like he's mad at halftime up 30. He's mad. And it's because he saw some very little things. It's almost Nick Saban like uh, my favorite quote from Nick Saban was always most coaches. He said this in some interview setting. Most coaches say that, hey, we're going to keep practicing this, guys. You if you've ever played sports, you've heard this from a coach. Guys, we're going to keep practicing this until we get it right. We're going to do it until we get it right. Coaches say it all. The, I see it at seven year old baseball. Guys, we're going to do this till we get it right. You know what Nick Saban says? We're going to do it till we never get it wrong. We're not going to do it till we get it right. We're going to do it till we get it right so often that we never get it wrong. That's when you know you're prepared. And Dan Hurley seems to have that exact same mindset. It's in part why he's uh, the coach of the reigning national champions and 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 the favorite, the coach of the favorite to win the 2024 NCAA tournament in this moment. Circling back to the broader um, conversation about how this Sweet 16 has become very chalky. You all, every time I try to put number one, number two, number three, number four in a final four, you know, it could be in yeah. the preseason, off season, January, somebody, some editor somewhere will send us an email like, hey, I need some final four picks and I'll just go one, two, three, four out of the top 25 and one. And you are always right. so eager to tell me, you're always so eager to tell me, GP, it doesn't work that way. The top four teams aren't going to get to the final four. What are you doing? Hey, are you... You realize we're not there yet. Are you, are you going to do this? Do you need? I'm, do you I'm, need me? To, I mean, do you need me to, to preemptively? Am I dropping this on the TV version right now? I was wrong. I mean, am I doing that before we get there? I think I'm ready to do it. I think I'm ready to take four number one C's. Are you going to apologize <laughs> for mocking me for for twelve months a year? For, for always thinking the best teams should be the teams that are projected to go to the final four. When this happens, if it happens, are you going to apologize right, publicly? I'll take, I, I will take, I will take the L. Okay. But I, we got to, we perish. We have to get there and also acknowledge this by nature of having, I think we have the sixth or seventh chalkiest sweet 16 in history. It increases the chances that we will not have all four. Yes, we have all four into the second weekend, so that's good. But because of the competition that still looms out there, there's a better chance that they all won't break through. At least acknowledge that as a distinct possibility, please. I'll acknowledge that as nerd math. I'll acknowledge that as what that is nerd math. As, but it's I also think known I'm as with... math. But yes, okay. Yeah, but all math is nerd math. You know that as well as that's I do. That's correct. There we go. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you know, so that, you know like that as well as I do. Ice cream. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I'm leaning towards. I'm leaning toward taking all four number one seeds to the final four. But we'll uh, we'll end this show with updating our final four picks. When we come back, turn our attention to the coaching carousel. Oh, buddy. It's been a busy all day long. West Virginia's got a new coach. Washington's got a new coach. Vanderbilt's got a new coach. Stanford's got a new coach. Kentucky seems to be trying to figure out if it wants a new coach. Louisville's still looking for one. We'll talk coaching carousel next. It's the Island College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. It's time for a little all-star college basketball. It's the Reese's College All-Star Game, April 5th on CBS Sports Network.
Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. I am Gary Parrish. Matt Norlander is here with me. And you can never just enjoy the NCAA tournament because that coaching carousel is always spinning. Just in the past uh, 24 hours, Darren DeVries is the new head coach at West Virginia. Danny Sprinkle is the new head coach at Washington. Mark Byington's the new head coach at Vanderbilt. Cal Smith, the new head coach at Stanford. Dead leg, let's stop right here. It's been a busy little stretch in coaching carousel news. What stands out and to I you? Um, I'm begging the college basketball news cycle to slow down and take a minute, please. I'd like to say hi to my children when they get home from school a little bit enough. Let's take a pause here. As for the ones that have been hired, uh, I'll be quick on each one here. Uh, Darren DeVries was West Virginia's top target for a while. Uh, they get their guy. He has been tremendous at Drake, uh, 21 seasons every Every time, every time he's been there, six seasons uh, total, been to three tournaments. Tucker DeVries, his son, is expected to go with him to West Virginia. Uh, he's a good talent, might earn an NBA paycheck one day, but, uh, but I think the expectation is that he'll give it a go there in Morgantown, and um, that's, a, that's an intriguing one. All of this, by the way, was a waterfall effect from Dusty May picking Michigan. Nothing, None of these were going to move until Dusty made his decision. Uh, people, Some people thought that Louisville was going to be the pick there. We'll get to Louisville in a second, but he takes Michigan, and now we have the cascading effect. So uh, DeVries to West Virginia, and then we had Kyle Smith. This was done late Sunday. I think they just had to put a few buttons on stuff on the West Coast early Monday morning. Kyle Smith was the target for Stanford uh, going back weeks, and um, he uh, he's making the move because, in part, Washington State's getting downgraded to the WCC, so he keeps a high major job. It makes a ton of sense. I think of all the fits, I think Kyle Smith going to Stanford, of the ones that got done today, I think he is the best one. Um, the question is his his steepness, GP. Going to the ACC, other side of the country, it's a hard job. NIL-wise, it's not in the same stratosphere as a lot of other high majors, but I do really, really, really like the hire. Then we had Danny Sprinkle going to Washington. The intrigue there was that Vanderbilt was really, really pushing hard on Sprinkle. He did seriously consider Vanderbilt, but Sprinkle has only, you know, he's been a West Coast guy, has ties to Washington, dad played football there, and also going to the Big Ten. So we got a couple of movements between uh, guys going into new schools, going into new leagues. Uh, but that makes sense, and he has been outstanding. His Utah State team got blitzed by Purdue, but he made the past three tournaments at Montana State, and Utah State just won the league. And then buying 10 to Vandy was the one that kind of swooped in out of nowhere here. Um, Byington was uh, was waiting on deck, and that got done with a swiftness on Monday morning. He just had JMU. I mean, we're talking less than 18 hours removed, 16 hours removed from getting uh, just <laughs> punted out of the bracket by an awesome Duke team. So after a 32-win record season at James Madison, he now has the Vanderbilt job, was a dark horse pick, winds up getting it there. Um, solid, solid job overall. And, uh, and, oh yeah, by the way, a Pearl Jam fan. So, uh, Mark Byington moving to music city. And that's kind of an instant recap of, uh, of what we've had here over the past, as you said, less than 24 hours. It has been a whirlwind. Dusty may, like you mentioned, takes the Michigan job. He could have had Louisville reportedly if he wanted that Louisville also reportedly targeted Scott drew. So at the very least they are moving on to option three. Where do you think Louisville turns next? Now that dusty may has for all intents and purposes, picked Michigan over the university of Louisville. All right. I, I will say a couple of coaches who are not going to get the job. Um, and I think you'll have a, a thought on it because um, I, I have not even like, frankly, I have barely checked social media all today. It's been just way too busy, but apparently in the past, like 24 hours, like get will Wade to Louisville has been a thing, but um, I've been told that because Louisville is on probation, it's just one, it's not going to pay a super high buyout. So like you're, and like Mick Cronin has been a candidate for a while, but like Mick Cronin, NATO, these guys are not candidates, but like Sean Miller, Will Wade, anyone that has a, an issue in their past, Chris Beard, um, Bruce Pearl, these guys are not Louisville candidates. They're just not. Um, so with that in mind, they are, you know, they're scanning far and wide. Shaheen Holloway at Seton Hall has been looked at. Amir Abdul Rahim from South Florida has been looked at. Pal Kelsey at Charleston has been looked at. And there are even deeper names. The problem for Louisville right now is that as we talk GP on Monday afternoon in the 2 p.m. Eastern hour, the only high major jobs left are Louisville. Oklahoma State and SMU, like Vandy's been able to close. Stanford's been able to close. Washington's been able to close. West Virginia, all these other schools, they're getting their guys. And Louisville wants to get it right. They want to get the right guy. But clearly, like, you know, they were hoping to get either a Scott Drew or a Dusty Main. It just didn't go right for them. It's coming off just the worst the worst run. It's the nadir of the program. And so you have to get the right guy in. Um, I wonder if Steve Lutz at Western Kentucky is a, is a sneaky name that maybe could be possibly in play there as well. Um, 
it's uh and but i also told i think he's also uh, a real candidate at oklahoma state as well um but yeah louisville's in a tight spot uh not quite i don't i don't expect movement for louisville Wednesday at the earliest. I just think uh, the athletic director, Josh Harrod is, is going to take his time and refuses to make uh, a reactionary decision because this is a very big hire for him. And understandably so both fan bases in that bluegrass HGP, they're both really gripping right now for very different reasons. Yeah. Obviously the biggest story in that state, maybe not within the city of Louisville, but around the state is the future of John Calipari after Kentucky lost uh, to Oakland in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. It's been a rough go for John uh, in recent years. Hasn't made the Sweet 16 since 2019. Hasn't been to a Final Four since 2015. Lost in the tournament to St. Peter's. Now lost in the tournament to Oakland. Um, there seems to be some real thought that his job might actually be in jeopardy, even though the buyout is in excess of $30 million. Uh, what do you believe is the latest on the John Calipari situation at UK right now? My understanding is that Calipari will meet with Mitch Barnhart, the athletic director, no later than Tuesday to just sit down and really have a long, difficult conversation about what what's going to happen here moving forward. The two just don't have a healthy, good, strong, friendly relationship. And, uh, you know, that's been the case for a while. It is complicating matters, but... You know, that $33 million buyout cannot, like, it has to rely on some of the biggest donors around that program. And from my understanding, like, the people that would be responsible for footing that bill just don't have an interest in paying all, like, as much as $33 million to allow John Calipari to just walk off with the bag and needing a semi to get it out of Lexington. Um, so if, if that can't be resolved, uh, if it can... Can you get it down to say 20 million? He's a UK ambassador. I still think he wants to coach maybe long shot SMU trying to make it. Ha SMU has tons of money. I don't, I don't know if that's an, if, if that's an escape route or not, but it has been suggested to me by two different people. Like, you know, just, you know, long, long, long shot. But if, if there was an escape, like maybe that could be done. Who knows? Right. Um, but if short of that, if with Cal staying, uh, I don't think it's healthy for the long-term outlook of the program, the fan base. It's really toxic and it's not going to ever get better. He has reached a point where the next thing that goes wrong, it's just, it's a firestorm GP. And so I would expect significant staff changes. If he stays, um, it is wait and see privately. I think they'll have more clarity within 48 hours on where things stand with Cal at Kentucky. Yeah. There's a, a lot of people who believe for the reasons you pointed out and others that ultimately he will return as Kentucky's coach, but under incredible pressure um, from the fan base and, and obviously real job pressure. If he didn't have a fabulous season next season, then I think everybody would agree. It, it's got to be, be over. But my um, experience with these types of situations is ex exactly as you laid it out. When it gets so toxic, this toxic, you never get it back. It never, it never gets back to where you had it before or where you'd like it to get. You can put that stuff off. You can put it off for a year or two. But once you reach the point where John is at right now at Kentucky, then your next bad year is your last one. And it doesn't matter if it's next year or the year after or the year after. Your next bad one, you can't survive it. Tom Crean at Indiana was a great example of this. He was on the hot seat. They were ready to get rid of him. The fans had sort of clocked out on it for a variety of reasons. And it was like, okay, if he has one more bad season, then we're going to do something about it. And he won the outright Big Ten title. So they couldn't do anything about it. Like, well, you can't fire a guy who wins an outright Big Ten title. That's outrageous. So they keep it. And then the next year, OG Ananobi gets hurt. They struggle. Boom. They get him just like that. Less than a year after winning an outright Big Ten title, they fired him because they wanted to do it. And then they put it off and then they said, OK, but the next time we get an opportunity to do it, we're jumping on it. And that's what they did. This will this will be the exact same thing. If John Calipari is coaching at Kentucky in the 2024-25 season, he might be great. I'm not here to, to predict otherwise, but if he isn't, it'll be over. And even if he is. If he's not also great the following year, then it'll be over. And if even, even if he is the following year, if he's not great the year after that, then it'll be over. His next bad year is the last one, and that's just a hard way to do a job. Agreed, but people were thinking that this the next bad year, meaning this or the next bad ending would be the last one. 
Um, I also don't know who can t- the, the, it's, 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 a, it's, you know, they have to figure out who would replace John Calipari. And at some point it's gotta be someone. And just because if, if, and when you lose Cal, if it's, you know, next year, the year after, if it's, you know, four days from now, who the heck knows, um, someone's going to take that job and you eventually have to be able to turn the page. It just has reached, it's reached a very problematic point. In addition to the fact that, you know, a lot of the roster this season is going to move on. There's just, and talking to one person, there's a, there's a real sense of just squandered opportunity. They keep losing postseason games, winning sec tournament games really, really matters to the Kentucky fan base. And Cal has, I think he's two and six in the past four sec tournaments or past six, uh, two and six in the postseason, the past what, four years overall. It's a problem. And like Reed Shepard, mom and dad played at Kentucky from Kentucky. One of the most talented players from that state to ever commit and play for Kentucky. And it could have been this awesome family legacy story. And instead it ends like this. Now he's probably going to go pro because why wouldn't you? He's projected to be a top 10 level pick. Um, and so it's just a feeling of like Antonio Reeves came back and he was one of the best players in America. And look where, look what it got us. Rob Dillingham. He never started like Reed Shepard. Look where it got us. You know, DJ Wagner, highly re- touted recruit. There was just a lot of like stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And that's piling onto the, the years of frustration with all this. Um, it will be intriguing uh, to see what uh, Kentucky decides to do. Again, I'm going to repeat what I told you on the Thursday night tournament reaction pod when we were talking about Kentucky losing to Oakland. If Calipari stays and remains as the coach of Kentucky, the only reason that will be the case, the only reason is because they cannot get the money or come to a conclusion where they want to pay him that much to lo- no longer coach there. If, if, if this buyout, in my opinion, was $15 million, I, I think – this would be just about done at this point, but it's not, it's more than double that. We'll be back on CBS sports network on Thursday. By then I assume we'll have some clarity on the John Calipari situation at Kentucky. And if so, we'll discuss it then for now, let's get back to the games. When we come back, we got Thursday games to look forward to Friday games to look forward to. What are the biggest ones on the schedule? We'll discuss that next. It's the Iron college basketball podcast. We're on CBS sports network. You came down here to tell us that your date is missing. I did not get ghosted. I think he was taken. You were dating as a way to face your divorce. Was I really the only thing holding you together, dude? Damn. Ready or not, I am in search of a man with whom I had a beautiful connection. You can't hide. If anything feels off, we'll go. Off, off. Murderer. Who are you? Diara. Diara? Welcome back to the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. I am Gary Paris, joined by Matt Norlander. And we go from last Thursday having 16 games to celebrate and last Friday having 16 games to celebrate. Now our options are limited for this Thursday and Friday. We only got four on Thursday, four on Friday. Norlander, what Thursday game in the Sweet 16 are you most looking forward to? I'm going to pick the one that I'm going to be at. Um, I'll be in Boston Thursday night. I'm going with the nightcap. Uh, approximately around 10 oh nine, 10, 10 Eastern TBS. I'll go Iowa state versus Illinois, uh, Iowa state coming through after, you know, getting past South Dakota state with not much of a resistance. Washington state was up early and it pushed on through TJ Otzelberger's team is big. I actually had to rank the sweet 16 teams power rank for CBS sports HQ spotlight, which is coming up by the way, at 3 PM Eastern, um, in that hour, I'm going to, I'm going to give you Iowa state fifth overall as it should have been the best two seed so that in addition to illinois no doubt about it over moorhead state no doubt about it over duquesne and ending keith dambrot's career i really love the offense versus defense there and you've got uh, a fan base guaranteed to be just thrilled with finally breaking through to a to an elite eight after quite a long drought either on either side so give me of all the thursday ones i'm going to pick that one in boston thursday night well, it's pretty clear we could program television networks because the nightcap is supposed to be the preferable game. You're going with the one in Boston. I'm going the one out in the West region, North Carolina against Alabama. Carolina really impressed me um, with what it was able to do against Michigan State. Not that it beat the Spartans, but that it went down 12 to Tom Izzo in March. That's a scary situation. This is a guy 
Izzo, who has won more times as a lower seated, worse seated team than anybody in the history of the NCAA tournament. So when you are North Carolina, you worked so hard to be a one seed all season, and now you look up, you're playing Tom Izzo, Michigan State, and you're down 12 early. Like, how do you respond in that situation? The clock's tick, tick, ticking, and they just, boom, erased that deficit, built their own double-digit lead, and made it the final minutes of that completely drama-free. And so now you get, you know, a couple of all-American level guards and R.J. Davis and, and Mark Sears, either one of those guys could go for 30, 35, even 40 in this game. So that's the one on Thursday I'm looking most forward to. North Carolina, Alabama should be terrific. On Friday, what do you got your eye on? I'll be quicker on this one, GP, because there's they're all very good. But you know what? Give me the double-digit seed. I'm most intrigued to see if Shaka Smart can get to an Elite Eight for the first time since 2011. I'm intrigued to see if the NC State with story with DJ Burns can keep on going down there in Dallas. A uh, rematch of a championship game more than 50 years ago, or 50 exactly 50 years ago. Uh, that one's the one that, that intrigues me most. Just will we continue to see an all-time run by NC State continue? But, the, but Friday, we are absolutely spoiled across the board. I'll go with the nightcap in the South region. That'll be Houston and Duke. Um, it's sort of like the the five star McDonald All American future NBA players against a a team ran by a man Kelvin Sampson who has built this program in an entirely different way. Like it, not to suggest that Kelvin wouldn't take a five star McDonald's All American. He took one in advance of last season, Jarris Walker. But your typical Houston player is going to be a a you know a, a borderline top 100 recruit or a sub 100 recruit in the case of Jamal Shedd, who has developed into a high level college player, perhaps even an NBA prospect. At Duke, they sort of come to Duke as NBA prospects. So I just like the contrast between these two programs, Houston Duke. And though I do have Houston winning that game because I had Houston in the final four on selection Sunday, I will say three games ago, we watched Houston lose by nearly 30. And in mm. the round of 32, we watched him give up 95. Now it was 95 in 45 minutes, an overtime game, but there were points in the season where I'd have told you Texas A&M or, or a, a team like Texas A&M could play against Houston for 55 minutes. And I don't think they're going to get to 95. So there's a little bit of some, I don't know, Perhaps just areas of concern for Houston. They haven't looked as sharp recently as they looked for most of the season. Would you agree with that? I would. And quickly here, when I had to power rank the, the Sweet 16 teams, I didn't know what to do with Houston because I want to give a, a respect to what they've done all season, but also give a little bit of recency bias, i.e. a power ranking here. And I've got them as a three overall, but I'm not. I, I almost put them five. I almost put them behind Carolina and Iowa State. They did escape. Jamal Shedd, you are an absolute boss. But uh, I would I would venture, while everyone's going to have a really tough prep here going up to Sweet 16, I, I really don't know if anyone's going to have a, <laughs> a harder preparation leading up to their Sweet 16 game than whatever Kelvin Sampson and that staff is going to uh, remind his team of. Got a few minutes left in this show. When we come back, we will update our final four picks because, yes, I already lost one, so I'm going to have to replace it with somebody else. You know. final, four picks, you know. final four picks coming up next. It's the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Island College Basketball Podcast. It's time before we get out of here to update our final four picks because we have to because we've already lost. At least me, I lost one. Rest in peace to Baylor. I had Baylor and three number one seeds in the final four, but I lost the Baylor Bears. And Scott Drew promised me he was not going to let this happen. I don't know why he did this. That was unkind. Baylor out. I'm still going to keep UConn. I'm going to keep Purdue. I was leaning towards switch it up, going with Duke over Houston, but I'm going to stick with Kelvin Sampson. And then I've got North Carolina. I'm going all four number one seeds to make it to Arizona, wow. Norlander. At much to much to your dismay and disappointment, I'm going to have all four number one seeds in Arizona with us for the final four. Gosh, by the way, I had St. Mary's lost to Grand Canyon, got an exclusive quote from Bryce Drew when he did that. This is Bryce, and I don't care. He did not. St. Mary's, see ya. So that's my final four team that is out here. I am going to, I still have three, I've got three alive. I got UConn, still here, not shifting off it. Houston, going down with the ship, not shifting off Houston. And Creighton, after surviving double overtime in 
arguably the game of the tournament. I think either Creighton, Oregon, or maybe Florida, Colorado has been the game of the tournament so far. I will go Arizona in the West. I am not giving you, I'm not giving you even uh, three one seeds. I can't do it. So I will go Arizona, get out of there. Uh, but the West, the West feels like the region that still has the most capacity for the wildest endings, the craziest outcomes. But that's my renewed final four. Sure to be wrong. All right, let's get out of here. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Eagle Legend. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Thank you guys for being here. We'll be back on CBS Sports Network on Thursday afternoon. Can't wait to talk to you then.